Welcome and good afternoon uh, to the 49 North uh, virtual meeting platform featuring today Rupert Resources and their CEO, James Withall, and their head of corporate development, Thomas Creedland. Thank you guys and thank you all for participating. Um, just a quick little housekeeping item as it pertains to Q&A. Uh, you will see on your screen, at the bottom of your screen, two icons or buttons uh, for Q&A. One simply says Q&A. Uh, that is a write-in option uh, for you if you have a question for uh, James or Thomas. And with that option, you can utilize that option throughout the presentation and they will address your question uh, as the presentation progresses. Uh, the second option is an audio uh, direct voice option or button. Uh, and that is, well, what we encourage is for those who wanna do direct voice to James and or Thomas, um, what we encourage is for folks to hold off to the conclusion until the conclusion uh, of the presentation and go from there. So uh, if that's clear, um, we'll get started here and we are delighted to have Rupert Resources uh, featured today on the 49 North meeting platform. And Rupert is advancing a permitted and recently producing gold mine called Potavara in Northern Finland. And today, we have, again, the CEO, James Withall, and the head of corporate development, Thomas Creedland, presenting the story uh, for Rupert Resources. So for, without further ado, I've got uh, the great James Withall and the great Thomas Creedland. And boys, take it on. OK, well, thanks very much, Matt, for the introduction. Um, welcome, everyone, um, this afternoon to you guys this evening for us, us here in the UK. So. Um, yeah, it's going to be all about Rupert Resources. Uh, Rupert Resources is an exploration company, but I'd describe it as an exploration company, uh, gold exploration company, with, with a number of key differentiators from others that you may come across in the sector. Uh, as Matt just said, we, we own this mine that you can see in front of us. This is the part of our gold mine. The, um, the company managed to buy this back at the bottom of the market in 2016 for just two and a half million dollars. So. It, uh, you know, it was an exceptional timing to pick up this past producing gold mine that has produced um, in the order of 350,000 ounces. It, it has a permit to operate, it's half a million tons a year. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting asset in itself. But what we're gonna tell you about is not just the mine today, we're also gonna tell you about the, the regional opportunity. And that is um, one of the key reasons that I joined the company in 2017. So. Yeah, we have all this infrastructure in this way to turn our discoveries into production, which you can see. And this is where all our guys in Finland are based. And uh, this is just like, this is a picture from last summer, but it's a beautiful sunny day, day there today, 27 degrees. So it looks pretty much the same. Um, so my background, just a bit of previous, I, I was a fund manager before this, and uh, I was invited to come and look at this project by the by Rupert Resources um, before I joined it um, as a potential investor. And what I saw then was a great opportunity here, but also um, when they bought the mine, they'd also picked up, up one of the most strategic land packages in what like this, this very emerging, um, I guess, potentially quite hot exploration districts of the world right now in Northern Finland in what we call the Central Lapland Greenstone Belt. So I can tell you a bit about the mine, but also a lot about the, the upside and the discoveries we've been making over the last couple of years. So without further ado, we will... Um, we'll, uh... So obviously the cautionary looking statement, we will be making some forward looking statements. So this is in the, in the presentation. Um, so key highlights said, we have a permanently, permitted recently producing gold mine, but that's a good start. Um, Finland is a fantastic jurisdiction with it in which to work. Um, again, um, when I was considering leaving fund management to go back into the mining industry, um, certainly Finland is up there amongst the best jurisdictions to work in. It's very safe. Uh, land tenure, licensing is very good. And um, certainly all those sort of those things that you normally have to worry about with some mining companies, we don't have to worry about uh, uh, here because we're not in a remote uh, part of the world or, or a jurisdiction where our, our licenses are uncertain. Um, I said my background, um, 
I'm formerly a geologist. I worked in Australia, in Western Australia for the, in the 1990s. And then in 2003, I went into fund management and uh, was a partner and fund manager at Baker Steel Capital Managers, one of the leading gold funds, gold equity funds in the uh, well, globally at the time, we, uh, we grew from a, a relatively small hedge fund into one of the biggest natural resources funds in the last cycle, uh, managing up to $1.8 billion um, out of the UK. And, and obviously with that, it gave me a lot of exposure to hundreds of companies, uh, and obviously potentially thousands of these projects around the world. So um, I guess my, the way I approach this company is quite similar to how we were running fund management. It's all about being successful in any business is all about allocation of the cash and the capital provided by the equity holders um, and allocating that in a very disciplined, systematic way and making sure you allocate that to the highest returning assets within the company. Um, so with that, that's what we've been doing. Whilst we're on this page, I think it's really important to sort of talk about Finland, that, you know, whilst it's obviously in a developed world and um, it's got a hundred year uh, mining um, history, a lot of the sort of exploration previously was done by the state and it was really only open to open to foreign ownership in sort of 96 when Finland joined the European Union so um, you know you really you've really seen the sort of the first few sort of major gold discoveries made in the last 20 years and you compare mm -hmm. that with some of the other really high yielding um, gold provinces of the world like kind of uh, the Abitibi in Canada or the eastern gold fields in in Australia they, they're all they've all got a hundred and 150 year um, exploration and prospecting histories. Yeah, so this is a, a very new part of the world and maybe some of you may well have not have come across it before, um, uh, but you'll see in the next uh, couple of slides forward, uh, we are located in the, our main project part of Aris, it's in the north of Finland here, surrounded by Agnico Eagle, obviously one of the biggest producers globally with the Kittler mine, Europe's largest gold mine, um, Kvitsa, Beliden is the Swedish company that owns that. Many of you may have known the previous owners, First Quantum Minerals, and Sakati, which is one of the largest base metals discoveries of the last 15 years by, by Anglo-American, uh, little known about because it's sitting up here um, in a big company, but it's a, a fantastic discovery. So that's great potential. So what have we been doing? Uh, we've been focusing on making new discoveries and over the last 12 months, we've demonstrated six brand new Greenfields gold discoveries outside of the part of our mine. Uh, that's obviously attracted the attention of our our peer group and other big companies in the sector and Agnico Eagle became a strategic investor into Rupert Resources in February of this year, taking a 9.9% stake for $13.1 million. Um, so obviously that was, uh, it was a long time in the making. I have a relationship with, with the company for, as a fund manager, but it was more about their technical team seeing what we were doing and, and the opportunity we were creating. So just a bit more about the team, a bit more colour. I told you a bit about myself. Um, we have a Swedish chairman. Um, he, is, um, he knows a lot about building businesses in this part of the world in Scandinavia, which is absolutely important and how to operate in this part of the world. Um, we have a strong CFO, um, I guess, in terms of the, you know, his experience in big companies and small companies. Um, Mike Sutton, a few of you may well have, if you've been following Kirkland Lake Gold for a long time, and, and I've known the founders and known Mike for, almost 20 years now. Um, obviously, you know, he was the, the key geologist behind the discovery of what is the South Mine Complex at Kirkland Lake in Canada, so a fantastic discovery. And he sits on our board as a, as a director and, and as input into the geology. Tom Cribbins joining me on the call. I think Charles a Corp Dev. Um, we met 20 years ago in Western Australia um, and uh, had a long history in corporate finance and, and, and broking. And then in country, I think is absolutely key for understanding the best play, way to operate in a country like Finland is to have majority Finnish staff and people resident there. Um, and we're led in country, we have a country manager, Paul Yukonimlin, who's very experienced, knows all the people in the government to speak to and all those the, the important parts of permitting and licensing. But, but I guess overriding even that is having a really strong exploration manager on the ground in country living there. And that's what we have in Dr. Charlotte Seabrook. And she joined the company in 2000, mid 2018. Um, and we were looking for someone to come in with lots of international experience, lots of discovery experience to lead our local Finnish team. And she does that, you know, absolutely excels in that. And she's been driving forward the discoveries and works directly with me in terms of ranking, where should we spend money, where should we not spend money and, and driving forward that. So, uh, you know, we, we, we have a list of advisors. Many of you may have come across those in other projects if you've been admitted with this industry, but. 
think it's important to find some of the best people in the industry from my background and Charlie's to support what we're doing and, and, and certainly, you know, test our theories and, and discuss it with them and, and bringing those in is very important. Um, capital structure is relatively simple. Importantly, 155 million shares on issue. Um, we have some warrants, which Agnico have, 11 and a half million at a dollar a share. So they're well in the money. Um, and we are, we put it just, but our, our annual financials in the end of February had $14.3 million in cash. So we've been very well funded. And I think leading on to that, I, I, I just want to spend a bit of time on this slide. So uh, hopefully more, the audience is probably well familiar with investing in the gold sector. Uh, and obviously, you know, gold shares still look relatively undervalued to gold and that's a great opportunity generally but i think this area down the bottom is, is more focused on expiration and the thing about successful expiration companies and you've heard the likes of, of ross Beatty talk about this with some of his companies it's about exploring right at the bottom of the cycle investing your dollars when you can do them most efficiently and that's what rupert by buying this asset at the bottom of the market created that opportunity there was a lot of invested money in the project in expiration. Um, so we could use all that data and the shareholders um, that uh, have been backing this company have invested in a pre the Agnico money, $30 million of their own money um, into the company to invest in really getting that expiration done. All the stuff that maybe the market doesn't really pay for, the science part of it, which is, which is probably the highest risk area. But what doing that well at the bottom of the market does is lead you into a strong discovery area. And if you can obviously make those discoveries into a stronger market, you can get very well rewarded for them. So that's the, the key principle for any exploration company, but certainly it is, is very much the case here. So a bit about the, the land position and where we are. So zooming into this area north of Finland here. Um, so this is our part of our license package. It's 40 kilometers long from east to west and, and up to 10 kilometers north to south. Um, are part of our mill and the Kittler mill, which I'm pointing out here, are the only two developed gold mills in this, in this part of the world, in this belt, in what is a very large belt that you could have a similar size, as Tom mentioned, to Abitibi or some areas of the Eastern gold fields. Um, so, you know, we both have between us, we hold a 300 square kilometer license package here. Agnico have a similar size at the other end of the package. And since I've been involved with the company, we now see the likes of B2 Gold operating in the region here, just to the west of us. Um, Kinross have her own active team in country uh, and another company, Orion Resources, operating to the south of us. So it's gone from, you know, maybe a, a sleepier area. And as Tom said, this is a very much a modern exploration area. Really, it's been the last 10 years where you've seen what I'd see beginnings of commercial exploration in this part of the world. And in the last few years, a real step up in that spend. And that's why you're seeing discoveries here. But the infrastructure is phenomenal. All our guys live in Sedankala, um, so they're based there. There's hydro dam facilities here, all these main roads. The other land use is logging. So that makes it very easy for us to, um, it's state-owned forestry, so very easy for us to move around our license package. And it's literally a 25 minute drive for our guys from their families in Sedankala to drive up to the main site where we operate from. We'll talk a little while about our area one discoveries and, and Ikari and things like that, which are, we've been very much promoted by both of some of the, the sales side analysts recently and the brokers. Um, this is all in this area, which is just five kilometers off this main road here. So again, very easy to access, which is obviously incredibly important. So James, well, we had that slide as well. I think it's kind of important that the two gold mines there were both discovered at surface because the rocks act, you know, were, were found at surface by, um, um, you know, the, the Kittler mine, which is now Europe's largest gold mine, was found by someone um, digging a road cutting. Um, but the kind of breakthrough in the kind of the, the model that we copied in a way to sort of for our, for our exploration um, strategy was, was um, uh, Anglo-American, um, who used base of till and um, uh, geophysics to find that, you know, this massive 40 million ton at 5% 5, 5 copper equivalent um, deposit. So. That was kind of the model we followed, but again, you know, all of those, all the uh, the main gold deposits have all been found at surface. Yeah. So I think um, you know, key thing for the company is obviously you know generating value for the shareholders, and how do you optimize doing that in exploration companies? Obviously, a key way of doing that is to make sure that you own the infrastructure already in place to develop the discoveries you have. So you know, 
it typically costs you in the order of 20 or 30 dollars an ounce to, to to find you know one or two million ounces so if you're going to go and do that you want to then try and get them you're going to spend that money you want to make the highest return on that money so the best way to do that is if you have infrastructure which has been well demonstrated by integra gold um, we've got bought out by El Dorado a number of years ago and more recently Richmond, the island gold mine in Canada, um, which was a similar size to part of our about 35,000 ounces a year. But then obviously got, you know, they started to demonstrate all this resource upside and bigger potential and, and Alamos bought that at quite a premium. They paid $350 an ounce of, uh, that they had at the time. So Rupert Resources, yes, we trade at a reasonable valuation for what we have. But that's based on 2018 resources, not our updated resource, and not on any basis of the expiration um, discoveries, which I'm going to mention. You compare that to some great deposits, certainly, but obviously if you just don't have infrastructure, you're never going to turn your 20 into 100 or $200 an ounce. You're only really ever going to get to maybe 70 or 80. So, you know, that infrastructure element to Rupert Resources, that differentiator is incredibly important. So I'm not going to go into too much geology. I'm just going to use a few slides here just to explain um, how we go about the business and, uh, and sort of translate the geology into actually how we invest in, in Rupert resources and, and create value. So, um, you know, when I joined the company two years ago, I said I you know, attracted, have some very good consultants that work with us, very experienced people that have been working in this industry, you know, um, far longer than me, probably another 20 years older than me. So they, I brought them in to really understand the true potential and really when you're looking for gold discoveries or gold things you're really trying to list off a uh, it's a list of ingredients that you need to find big deposits and you know the big and when i talk about big gold mines here i'm talking the things that are attractive to an agnico eagle so you know three million ounce plus deposits that will produce two hundred thousand ounce a year the sort of assets that you know that, that get bought um for you know hundreds of millions of dollars and that's obviously the value opportunity to create in in exploration companies so we we brought in some very skilled people to help us understand the entire region and, and make sure our license package which is all here which is this outline in dark blue um held all those key ingredients you know get, get as idea as early as possible you know and and here we just compare it to an area in western australia which you've probably heard of or kalgoorlie you've probably most definitely heard of you know, one of the biggest mines in in obviously australia and globally but all these other mines that, that occur in a similar geological setting to we have here, that pink lump there is very similar to here, all these black lines of structures, but just take it that this is this key structure here. And what the previous owners of this asset did very well was back in 2011, they put this land package in place. So when I said at the beginning, I was excited about the mine and the land package when we went to review it, this was why I got excited, 20 kilometer long trend of potentially very prospective area to find big gold deposits. So fast forward a year from then, um, obviously we had to work out, as Tom mentioned, a very good way to explore the area and the best, most efficient way to do that. Uh, and I said, we, we, uh, we were well funded. So we went to our shareholders and said, well, we want to carry on exploring at the mine because we see good potential there, but we want to demonstrate and our underlying philosophy is to demonstrate that economic potential or the geological potential of our entire all our assets so you know we we, we put forward a plan to invest up to 10 million dollars outside the mine and exploration and then we basically prioritize that spend to where we saw the highest return that you know that we could have and that again this 20 kilometer long corridor um, and within that a five kilometer long area called area one which you'll see referred to in our press releases and then you know to Tom talked about a method called base of till. And so the challenge um, in this environment is of a glaciated area, there's very little outcrop. Um, and so you can't just walk along and pick up rocks and find, uh, and find gold deposits. We, you can up here, and Orion have been very successful at that because there's a lot of outcrop and gold, veins of gold in it. But here it's all under maybe 10 or 20 meters of glacial till. Um, but there's a good thing, that's a good thing, because actually that means that it's probably had a big structure there, it's been eroded by the glaciers over the years, and then, you know, it, it, unfortunately, big deposits don't tend to stick out of the ground. Uh, um, so anyway, we, we focused on this area here, uh, and um, that started in late 2018, early 2019, uh, using this base of till method, and within 
I guess four months of starting that program, we'd already made three discoveries or potential discoveries, what we call, today we call them Hainan North, Central and South. And they were discovered from this method, geophysics and base tool, and just four drill holes. So we drilled four holes, two in one of them, and one in each of the other targets, and they all hit potentially economic mineralization. So, you know, moving on to this slide, it was, it was all about proving the concept and proving the methodology and, and, and that it would work and uh, that it could be repeatable and successful. And obviously, if you can have a repeatable, successful method to do exploration, you can generate a lot of value if you then go ahead and find big deposits. Um, so, yeah, this is a bit busy and a bit geologically, but what are the key elements? Uh, what are the key things you need to, to understand about the story? Um, you know, this this black line here is the same structure, which is this red line here, which is 20 kilometers long. There's another one just to the north. Um, this whole area structurally is still quite big. It's five kilometers by two and a half kilometers north to south. Um, we put the Kittler deposit here, Europe's largest gold mine. It's eight million ounces now. It goes down to 2,000 meters. I would just put on the, the surface expression of that to give you a sense of scale. Um, of these discoveries. So we now have, from drilling four holes a year ago, we've now drilled 80, 80 odd holes here, um, 13, 14,000 meters of drilling and, and all these little dotted lines are all these base of till samples. So key thing, look for the magenta dots. These are your high grade base of till anomalies on these structures. And then all the diamonds here are drill holes. And you can see there, they're all significant intercepts in drill holes. So all over this area. So we started with three discoveries, now we have six discoveries here in, in 12 months later uh, and most recently what the market's got very excited about and where you you know you see an analyst write up about is this hickory discovery which sits right on this structural zone here so we'll go and look at some of those drill we holes really good, we had a really good question on the um on the q a from robert he was asking are there any good parallels globally for the, for the setting we're looking at so i would, you would say you know, within it, within one of these greenstone belts, you would you could sort of easily see, you know, um, you know, between five and ten um, deposits over over a, over a million ounces on a on a within one of the greenstone belts, and then within within those greenstone belts, you often have you know what's termed a gold camp. So you would have, have again, you'd have um, you know two or three sort of mines along a, a particular trend or something. So um, mm. you know, very early days here. We've obviously. Um, we're kind of starting to get a hint that we, we might have some, something in scale. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know if you've got any insights. I, I guess the, the probably worth flipping back to this just to answer that question. All these KB, um, Paddington, or K, can only, if you look at this sort of scale, this is a, a similar sort of camp scale area in Western Australia. Here you have Canona Bell, which is you know, five to eight million ounces now, Paddington, which is six million ounces. Uh, uh, Golden Star here, which is another sort of million, million, million and a half, and some of these other deposits, which are all, um, you know, in the order of a million ounce deposits. So you tend to get, you know, in these sort of areas, these sort of similar settings, a collection, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a reasonable amount of deposits. So it, you could you could use that analogy, or maybe some of the West African analogies. Um, I guess the Lulu on Green Cotter Belt or something like that would would look not dissimilar to here. Uh, which is what is what was in Rangold is now in um, um, the uh, it is obviously now in Barrack. But certainly this this area uh, that also sort of this 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 area, it's key. Um, I guess to give you one geological takeaway of why we're excited because it, it's it's a we see this area as a very deep seated mantle tapping, you know, very deep structures. That's what you need for gold deposits. Again, going back to this list of ingredients. Um, and it's basically the coll collision zone between all these purple rocks here and all these orange rocks here up here. So they basically come together at this point um, two billion years ago. Lots of destruction, lots of structure, lots of fluid pathways, uh, and all those result in you know the mineralization that we're showing here, which is you know all these particular deposits. So so I'll go and maybe show you a couple of details on those. Um, the Ikari discovery are up in that structure. These are the first two holes from that discovery. It's a, it's a 500 meter long geochemical anomaly so far. We've still to do more work. Um, the drill holes were absolutely spectacular from it. You know, the first hole came back 54 meters of continuous mineralization at one and a half grams, very close to surface. The vertical scale there obviously is close to surface. 
And then the second hole started from surface and went for 137 meters at 1.8 grams. And, and it's not just one of these fudges where you have, you know, maybe a 200 gram intercept dragged over lots of meters. There's a high grade, you know, that's 25 grams. But here, you know, this first 40 odd meters of the hole runs almost four grams and it starts from surface. So you know, obviously that, that really grabbed a lot of people's attention. Obviously Agnico, who's, you know, been involved with the company, they're very excited about this as well. So it's, um, it certainly has all the, again, all the making of this big structural system, lots of fluid flow, all the right chemistry and all the things we as, a, as geologists and, and explorationists look for to potentially find, you know, deposits of scale, as I said. So this is, um, you know, obviously we've got to get back and, and drill test some of that, some more of this. Um, you know, there's some of the rocks and give you, you know, some of the grades, 10, 8, 12 grams, but over, over very good widths, which is absolutely important to be economic. Um, Haina South, we announced just, just last week, or week before last, uh, there was another discovery on that map. Um, again, some spectacular grade, 482 grams over a metre, right in the western end here of this. Um, we've drilled, as you can see, we've drilled a number of holes here, but still a relatively small amount. It's 400 metres long up to 20 meters wide, you know, some really, some really great grades in it. And obviously, you know, obviously some very spectacular visible gold in, in that hole itself in, in 33. But you know, again, we're not, our approach is that we allocate a small amount of capital initially. And depending on the results of that, we might drill 10 or 15 holes. We will then decide whether a project has the potential to have scale be, you know, million ounces plus. And then depending on that, we'll then allocate some more money or we won't if, if we don't think it's there we won't allocate more money at that point because we want to make sure that we get the highest return on the on the investments we made so james we had a really good question um on the, on the q a on uh, what's our philosophy on managing liquidity what's a comfortable cash balance relative to your expected burn rate over the next couple of years so i think you've always talked about not being a timid explorer so yeah so i i think that is a good question i think the the problem with this business and um, being an investor for many years is that many companies just don't commit to spending the money so they never really make the discoveries. Exploration is high risk and potentially very high return but you'll never make the high return if you're very timid with the allocation. We spend in the order of a million to a million and a half dollars a month running the company and on that basis you know that's you know we, we don't like to get to a level where we have really less than you know I guess four million, three or four million in the bank, ideally in the company. Um, but uh, we've been very well supported up until now, and obviously with the discoveries we've made, we can, we expect to continue to be well supported. And uh, Agnico's warrants, even themselves, are, are well in the money that could bring in another eleven and a half million dollars um, if they choose to exercise those. Um, I guess finally, Haina Central is you know yet another discovery here. It's copper and gold, relatively near surface. And you know, this is one of the discoveries that really got Agnico very excited about. The grades are very good, uh, and um, the fact that it has this you know scale again. I keep on mentioning that word. Um, I think it's important though to go back to the mine and understand that you know we've talked a bit outside the mine, but just to go back to full circle here and the, all this infrastructure we have here, we we've been very keen to make sure we really understand this better than previous operators. Why is it? Why did it go into administration? Because the people that owned it prior to us just didn't understand the true potential of it geologically. Um, the previous owners just focused on these orange areas, DB and Samurai, where they still left back left behind a huge amount of resources. Um, there was about 150,000 ounces when we when we bought it left over. We already put out a resource of just under half a million ounces in 2018, and the drilling results you can see here some spectacular results: 63 over 12 meters 220 grams over five meters these are all near surf surface near infrastructure um, and just demonstrate the fact that it just was very poorly understood um, you know we pushed on with this drill program this winter and uh, this last winter and into through to this spring and, and the key difference from when i started and when i joined the company they were only sort of hitting gold every you know 20 percent of the time now we hit very good good drilling sets over 80 percent of the time in the drilling in the mine and that's what you need that understanding and that that uh, all that geological knowledge to then start you know proving that this isn't just a, a small deposit it's now over you know over a kilometer long 400 meters wide goes down to over 450 meters deep in the development 
and luckily for us the previous owners have, have spent over 90 million dollars effectively on underground development that we can drive down and if if you could come to finland at the moment and, and see it you could we could go underground and we could drive down and i'll show you you know a 3.1 kilo sample in the wall uh, of, of some of the development that and, and that's not in the ore body that will well the, the previous operators didn't realize it was even there uh, we discovered it it's just in some infrastructure ventilation maze that they they put in and you know haphazardly developed it without understanding the deposit so we see great much more you know lots of upside here as well um and i think um, we, had a, we had a really good question i guess we're on this on the on the mine part now um yeah. question on, on what the um all in sustaining costs would be for this this operation so obviously we have 16 years of um historic costs for part of ara um it's quite hard to put a pin in what the um what an all in all, all in sustaining cost would be if we restarted it because the stuff that we're drilling now is a much higher grade than what they were mining at the, uh, you know, when they went into care and maintenance because they didn't understand the, um, the geology. But they did have, um, they did have very good, very low uh, mining costs and very low processing costs because the, the, the metallurgy was very straightforward. So yeah. there is that, there is a potential for it to be, you know, a, um, I don't know, James, sort of a, so a 700, 700 all in sustaining cost operation. Yeah, I think yes. I think at these gold prices, I think that's that's definitely a possibility, and I think that it, it's because their cost it's free milling gold. There's very little reagents used. The power cost is very low because the material grinds itself up. There's no grinding media, and and mining costs here incredibly low because the ground conditions are very good. So all the it ticks again a lot ticks a lot of boxes into being a very cheap operation to run. Um, and you could do it very efficiently. And I think if you then understood the geology, well, then you could start to really make some returns on it. Uh, and it hasn't, when I joined the company, the gold price was 950 euros an ounce. Obviously now it's 1600 euros almost an ounce. So, you know, when we did that last resource, you know, that was the, the gold price back then. The, the mar potential margins on even a small operation here uh, now have, you know, do look very exciting. So I'm going to stop there and probably hand it back to Matt. I just just to give you a sense of what's coming for coming next in terms of news. We have more results to come from Area One, this very exciting exploration area. We have uh, a resource update coming from the mine and potentially some other drill results coming from the mine. And um, how we run the business, we keep on. You know, we're continuing to look for new discoveries outside of the ones we've already made. So you know, whilst we've made six in the past year. You know, we'll be advancing a select number of those, two or three, to really showing how big they are over the next 12 months. And with that, hopefully, you know, you'll see you know, a growing resource at the mine, growing resources in the region, and then start showing a pathway to obviously unlocking locking that value through the infrastructure we have and, and taking it forward to, you know, uh, ultimately be a, be a production site in the future. And I think, um, you know, we... we um, we want to we stay very much stay in charge of our own destiny uh, um, but obviously if we do a really fantastic job at this i'm sure the likes of agnico eagle or some of their peer group will be very interested in what we're doing as well but um we're not we don't hang a for sale sign up we just get on with doing a really good job and our team does that and we demonstrate the, the economic potential of what is here uh, and um and focus on making sure that we we maximize that return for the on the equity i'm a big shareholder uh, uh, and, and you know, I think um, I think that's important, and so is the board and, and, and management. And I think we really want to uh, demonstrate we can you know, make some exceptional returns. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Matt. Well, James, great job, and that was uh, a very compelling presentation on Rupert. And I think we do have uh, some questions here from the audience, um, and I'm looking at from. One of our attendees, and I don't know if you addressed this, I didn't see Tom, uh, I saw kind of a similar question about the, the philosophy on managing liquidity. Um, you know, what is a, a comfortable cash balance relative to your expected burn rate over the next couple of years? Yeah, I mean, we have, we had 14 million, um, $14.3 million at the end of February. So we, we get through about a million or a million and a half a month. So we're still sitting with a pretty good cash balance at this time of year. Um, and so we're not, um, 
we're very fortunate with the whole COVID crisis to be honest that we raised that money in February with Agnico, so that's positioned the company very well. We, you know, again, I said before, we wouldn't want to get below, you know, you don't really run it, want to run it down into below three or four million because we really want to charge on with this. But at the same time, I'm very cognizant, you know, you know we've, we've made fantastic returns out of the liquidity we've already raised. Um, this next 12 months is how you really, where you get the optimal return out of the liquidity we have and potentially some more that comes into the company. Um, but I think um, that, uh, you know, that we, we, we won't carry on raising money forever. We want to, uh, we want to continue to develop the company to the next stage. So um, it's not a, it's not a, it's not an exploration company that just wants to raise 10 or $12 million every year to carry on doing exploration for fun. That's, that's not the business model. We want to uh, turn this into a real company and, um, and it, you know, either extract the value through turning into production ourselves, or obviously have the, the value demonstrated to us through a transaction. And just a quick question on my end: How how far um, in KMs is Potavara from Kittle? Is it pretty, pretty close? I'll, I'll take you back to that slide. It, it, it's about sixty five kilometers as the as the crow flies. It takes about if I was to leave the mine and drive there, it takes me about an hour and a half, but or just under that actually okay. to get there. Okay. Um, it, it's 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 relatively close, and if I went from Area One Discoveries out here. Um, that doesn't take so long at all. That's probably 45 minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we have another property um, called Hurley Property, yeah. which is kind of like about 20 k's from from um, from Kittler. Yeah, I think well, you know, that that we did some drilling there earlier on the year. There's there's another deposit there, which was they did actually truck that material over to Partavara, as well as there was a, another deposit here called Kutufuoma, which is part of the B2 Gold projects here. That was trucked into Par Partavara as well. So you know the infrastructure because the infrastructure is so good you can move material around and and we see our our mill here as being such a strategic position in the belt because if you want to permit a new project it's going to take many years but having this as you know there's potential for this sort of hub and spoke approach and you truck all these deposits and discoveries into our central facility and and just with with the history uh, of the region uh, so to speak how far do we date back in terms of Potavara and just the, the overall region itself as becoming um, what it is today? Are we looking at the 90s, the 80s? How far do we go back? So the government, the, the big advantage, what the big selling point for exploring in Finland was because the government geological survey spent a huge amount of money on exploration for base metals for the most part in the 80s and early 90s. And Potavara was discovered in 1986, as was Kittler. Um, as were most of these little gold dots that are around, because as Tom said, they were stuck out of the ground. Hervey was uh, pretty much at surface. Um, so they did. They spent a lot of money on geophysics, uh, and all that geophysics is still valid today because it's done not done that long ago, and the techniques haven't changed that much. And they had a lot of people out in the field doing work. Um, so that that's a big step forward. So yeah, we're talking mid to late eighties um, okay. for a lot of the work. So it's relatively. Recent, but as Tom said, not like Australia or even Canada, where you're going back a hundred years. Or yeah, years. We're, we're, it's um, it's sort of virgin territory to some extent. Ian, I've got another question from Steve. Is so the majority is oxide deposits here? Um, so so we have, uh, sorry, James. I was having a bit of dialogue with um, Steve on. Um, on the sort of minerality of the deposits. So I was saying that, that, that part of R is, is more of a kind of quartz carbonate sort of hosted deposit, whereas the new discoveries are, are sort of more sulf, you know, sulfide type, type things. Yeah. So Steve, follow up question was, you know, whether or not there are any oxide deposits here. Um, but I would say, you know, the Kittel is a, Kittel is a sulfide deposit. The new discoveries are, are pretty much sulfide deposits. So I would say the bigger deposits, it seems are gonna be a sul you know, sulfide. No, it, I guess in comparison to typical things, and it, yeah, we, we don't. Area one has an interesting, you know, one of the biggest issues we came up actually we found out when we started drilling the holes that they were weathered down to in some cases 75 meters. So there is an oxidation area, but if you're trying to compare it to maybe, I'd say, oxide stuff in the US, it, it, you don't have that sort of heat bleach scenario. You could certainly heat bleach the material, even at part of ARA, and you could possibly heat bleach some of this. But it's it, it's not oxide in that true sort of soft 
the free dig free diggable nature um, certainly maybe the top of Hainer Central is um, but you don't see that in this environment you're you're in a for the most part glaciated environment where all the soft rocks been stripped away anyway got it got it um, one other question for me when you did the financing deal with Agnico in February where was the uh, the price at that point yeah, the stock was about 72 cents actually when we started to get down to the finer points of uh, the, obviously the stocks, you know, despite making all the discoveries in September, and October, having essential and showing some fantastic results of the mine, yeah, the stock had done okay, but still January was still a bit of a tough time in the market. So yeah, we, we eventually settled on 85 cents for their financing, um, which was the same price we'd financed back in, back in last summer with our own shareholders, which was, I wouldn't. I wasn't going to go any lower than that price anyway. No, so we did it. We did. We did it at a premium. So I mean, you know, I think we we were we had the strength that you know our you know that our pre, our other investors would have been, would have backed us at the kind of previous issue price. So um, yeah, we did it at a premium. So um, they they must really have wanted it, right? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I, 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 yeah. I mean, a bit of colour on that. All our discussions with senior companies, we had the we were in the fortunate position with having our very you know, ultra high net worth backers that we could walk into the meeting and say, well, we don't really want your money, but we'd like to work with one of you that's can because we have a technical committee, they bring their ideas to what we do. But, you know, we, we wanted someone that we could effectively have a partnership with. Uh, and Agnico is a great company for that because, you know, it is a very well run company. Fantastic company, for sure. Um, one other just quick question, uh, if you could comment on COVID um, in its impact. Um, not only with your operations, but in the country as a whole. I mean, over here in the States, we don't really, I don't think, have a very good grasp on uh, kind of the impacts that are going to go, go on in a place, a country like Finland. So on a macro level, what is the impact on Finland? And then as it relates to you guys, uh, how has that been, uh, been affecting, you know, Rupert moving forward? Yeah, okay. So, so Finland, fortunately, is a, has a very low population density. You see, it's quite a large country. It's about 1,200 kilometers north to south and, and you know, three or 400 kilometers wide. Um, but they only have 5 million people. Obviously, most people are based in the south here, down near Helsinki and Tampere and all the areas down in the south. So they have had cases. I haven't got the latest numbers, but in order of hundreds of cases. Um, the death toll has been very low, though. Um, less than 100, I think, still. Um, they effectively closed the borders quite early. Um, Helsinki Airport is a big hub of flying into Asia, but that's been, been closed down as well. Um, and so they, we, could, we could come across the borders to move samples around and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's one thing. So it, it, the most they ever did, they implemented social distancing quite early on, quite proactively. They did that, which obviously affected us at work a little bit. But they never went to the whole two meters thing. They were sort of, you know, right. major, major, most distant. So we only have a team of 12 at the site. So for a while there, we had some of our geologists staying at home uh, and working from home. Um, but I guess keeping on the macro side, they really didn't, they had very few cases outside of Helsinki. Really, right. the, the other center of cases in Lapland, there's about 120,000 people in the whole of Lapland. And that Arctic Circle line gives you a sense of where Lapland starts, really. Rovaniemi is sort of central, but it is a big tourist spot. And Kitala, just nearby there, is the biggest ski resort in the country. Is um, it really? So it, yeah, it's just if you were standing at the Kitala mine, if you can see this when you're standing on the ski hill just here. Oh, got it. Where my mouse is. Uh, yeah. um, and so, um, yeah, there's, there's a sort of tourist center. So they did have some case there, and they had one case in the Kitala mine uh, itself that was reported. But what they did was then bring in mass testing of the entire community of Kittler and all the mine people. They tested like 1,200 people in like a two days period. And they obviously isolated the people with it and they just eliminated it straight away. I think there were 60, maybe there's 65 or 70 cases in the whole of Lapland. Wow. Um, and a minimal impact for you guys. Minimum, uh, our municipality, St. Ankela, is, is based here and it's sort of halfway through here. There's been no one case of COVID in that municipality so far. There's only 8,000 people in Sri Lanka. Um, but again, you know, to reiterate, you know, our, you know, other, some other companies that, you know, weren't 
you know, that we're operating weren't unscathed. You know, anyone with expats, basically, a lot of those companies demobilized and um, stopped ex exploration programs and, you know, everyone got out before before there were travel transport restrictions. So yeah. having a local team and a, and a and a head of geology that's based in Sedankula it was, was a massive advantage for us. So everything, yeah. you know, we were, we were kind of um, fortunate in the sense that we, you know, suddenly there was loads more um, drill rig availability. The labs, the lab, the turnaround and all the labs suddenly sped up, you know, obviously it'd been a hot area. So, you know, we were able to operate um, and it actually worked out really well for us. Um, yeah. yeah. I guess we, that's all that said. I think we're very conscious that, you know, this situation isn't over. Um, Finland have been, you know, they're still, you know, they haven't really opened the borders. You'd have to have a central reason to travel there still. Um, and they're being cautious um, mm -hmm. about it. Um, but uh, so I think. Unlike, unlike Sweden? Yeah, so it's obviously we're at the border with Sweden. So, you know, we get a lot of assays done in Sweden. But um, again, there you have quite a, the advantage of having small populations and big countries in Scandinavia is obviously quite key. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and in the nicest possible way, uh, maybe we've got some fins on the call, but um, they're not, they don't, they don't go out a lot. They don't socialize as much maybe as you're used, to, you'd be used to. So um, the schools have pretty much stayed open the whole time and things like that. So it's, um, yeah, it, it thought we'd be very fortunate. Um, obviously, I'm in the UK and t with Tom and obviously we're not as fortunate here. So. Yeah, yeah. Nor here, oh, that's for sure. No, uh, I think it's it was a really good, uh, and I don't want to. Um, I know we've short short of time, but I think it was um it'd been really hard to set up the business if, in this situation. I think it was a really good test of of how our kind of management systems and stuff were were kind of working, and that people have been able to get on with it. Actually, I think it's that right. You know, I think we were in the right sort of level of maturity in terms of the business to be able to just kind of cope with it. Uh, I, I, I I lived through the disaster recovery whole institutions in fund management, so. When I joined the joined Rupert Resources, I turned up and I was a bit worried when they said all the data stuck in a in a you know is that a mine site which in a building and I said right well the first thing we do is go to clouds everything's on the cloud everything's backed up globally and so really Tom and I's job apart from going to Finland we were already doing video calls and doing all this so it, it kind of hasn't changed. And Second so we, nature. Second yeah, nature. Yeah. yeah, you can be very you can have great continuity in what you do if you're already in this structure. Great, great stuff. Um, well, with that, guys, um, great presentation. I think this is an exceptional and very exciting story in the space. Um, I know there's a lot of chatter about you guys uh, within the, the industry out here and within the investment community uh, out here. There's been many on the call today. Matt, can um, I just... Sorry, yep. just while, before you wrap up, I just want to make uh, make the point again that we've, you know, we've we've still got some drill results to come back. So, um, okay. in, in general, we we're probably putting out drill results every um, three to four weeks. So we've got one more set of results back from our um, winter drilling campaign to come. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, you know, we will we'll be sort of, uh, you know, talking to the market again around those those results as well. I should think so. Um, if, they, if people can sign up, um, we, and I'm sure you'll, you'll keep them in touch, that would be great. Yeah, fantastic, yes. And yeah, thank you to all of our participants today. Uh, great meeting with James and Tom. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can see their contact details right there on the slide. Um, but a very good audience with a lot of uh, who's who in the business here on the West Coast. So we're really happy that they were able to uh, see the story and uh, get to know you guys a little bit in this presentation. And uh, again, thanks for everyone's time. And with that, this will be the conclusion of the presentation. And have a great afternoon and evening out there in the UK. Thank you, Matt. Thanks very much for sitting up. Much appreciate. And thank you, everyone, for, for taking the time to listen to the story. Much appreciated. Absolutely. Cheers. Thanks, Goodbye. guys. Bye.